Time for some honesty. How many of you have said in the last week to somebody, I am really busy? Okay, that's a lot of hands. That's a lot of hands. And not so surprising. When I came to Eastside Grace, I asked a question of our pastoral staff uh, about some of the challenges facing our congregation, you know, the spiritual challenges in particular. And the number one thing we came up with was actually busyness or a sense of maybe distraction by all the things going on. And of course, that's not unique to East Side. I mean, any evangelical church in North America, we'd probably hear a very similar theme. Busyness is a really big challenge that we face. In some countries in the world, they, uh, they don't have much in terms of financial resources, but they got a lot of time. And we're kind of flip-flopped. We have a lot of financial resources, but we don't have a lot of time. In 2013, a pastor named Kevin DeYoung wrote a book called Crazy Busy, a mercifully short book about a really big problem. And my favorite chapter in the book is entitled A Cruel Kindergarki. Kindergarki. Yeah, I had never heard that word either, but, you know, archi is, is the rulership of some, someone or some group. Kindergarki then would be rulership by kids. And DeYoung's point is that it's the idea that our kids run the show that contributes greatly to our busyness. He's got a great sense of uh, humor as he writes, and he, I'll quote here when he says, Parenting has become more complicated than it needs to be. It used to be, as far as I can tell, that Christian parents basically tried to feed their kids, clothe them, teach them about Jesus, and keep them away from explosives. <laughs> he continues, As nanny parents living in a nanny state, we think of our children as amazingly fragile and entirely moldable. Both assumptions are mistaken. It's harder to ruin our kids than we think and harder to stamp them for success than we'd like. Christian parents, in particular, often operate with an implicit determinism. We fear that a few wrong moves will ruin our children forever, and at the same time assume that the right combination of protection and instruction will invariably produce godly children. Being a parent is tough. Being a grandparent can even be tough. And even for those who aren't parents, having a significant influence in somebody's life with whom you're in a close relationship, that can be difficult. It brings heartache sometimes, doesn't it? It demands sacrifice. It requires the parent to come to grips with his or her insecurities and fears and spiritual struggles. What we need is some advice from a parent who both understands us and who understands parenting. Somebody who gets us but isn't frail like we are. What we need is the advice of God, the Heavenly Father. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Proverbs where we'll find that advice. I happen to believe that there's, a, there's some advantages in having a physical copy of the scripture with you on Sunday morning. So if you have access to such a copy, I'd encourage you to bring that. Uh, you can find a copy in the hub, or we'll make sure if you'd like to have one. Uh, maybe if you don't have a copy of the Bible, we'll make sure out there at the hub, we'll, we'll put you in contact with a physical Bible of your own. Uh, it's just helpful to follow along sometimes. You'll also know that you can get copies of the Bible on an app for your phone, which is a great way to access the Scripture anytime, anywhere. If you don't have either of those options, you'll find the Scripture that we're going to be reading on the screens behind you as, as we continue along. The Proverbs, it turns out, present a great deal of wisdom from God on the topic of parenting. For today, we're going to capture that wisdom in three principles, which you'll find on the sermon outline, which is on the bulletin you received as you came into the sanctuary. The first principle is this. Wise parents transmit God's blessing. Wise parents 
transmit God's blessing. The book of Proverbs repeats certain phrases and certain concepts and certain themes. The fear of the Lord, the idea of wisdom, knowledge, discipline. On the flip side, the Proverbs also talk about folly and a foolish person. But one of the themes that occurs over and over and over is the theme of the wise parent. And the way it occurs is in a, a way that might be a little subtle to us. It's a phrase that we see more than 20 times in the book of Proverbs, and it's the simple phrase, my son. My son. If you read through the book of Proverbs, you're going to see that phrase over and over and over. Why does this phrase occur so many times? Because it expresses the relationship that we're supposed to understand is the context for all the instruction in this book. The entire book is presented by a father, a parent, to his child so that that child will grow in wisdom. This parent-child relationship is the greenhouse in which the wisdom of God is supposed to grow. Many of us are parents, Every single one of us is a child of parents, right? We understand the parent-child relationship, whether our experiences have been good or bad or more likely some combination of the two. Parents are the single biggest influence in a child's life, and the reason for that is simple. The parent influences the child in the closest of relationships at the time when the child is most moldable. One of the key ways parents shape children is by communicating to the child what is good, what is desirable, what is worth seeking. We do that with our children all the time in various ways. We sometimes by our words, sometimes by our actions, communicate Son or daughter, this is something that our family values. This is something that we think is important, or this is something we want to avoid. And in the many passages of the Proverbs where we see the father's call to his son, this idea of communicating what is good is very prominent. The father tells his son boldly and explicitly what is good and what is valuable. So what is it that's so good and valuable according to the Proverbs? It's actually the Father's instruction in wisdom. Listen to Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Did you hear that? My son, don't forget my commandments. Don't forget my teaching. Keep my commandments. Don't let steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. My son, this wisdom I'm sharing with you is good. It's valuable. It's critically important. But like any good parent, the father doesn't just say to the son, Son, you need to be wise because I said so. He explains why the child should desire to be wise. Just the passage that we read, that little passage, lists several big benefits from following dad's wise instruction. Length of days and years of life, peace, favor and good success in the sight of man. But if you were to continue on in the Proverbs, you would find a laundry list of further benefits to following this wisdom. Wisdom will protect your life, son. Son, you will know God. God will protect and guide your path. You'll be delivered from evil men and wayward women. You'll gain things more precious than silver and gold and jewels. You'll have peace when you lie down to sleep. You'll experience healing. You'll be protected from deep regrets in life. You'll bring joy to your parents. You'll avoid poverty. You'll have a future and your hope won't be cut off. You'll avoid sudden disaster. Do we get the point? There are a lot of benefits to the son from following wise instruction. And the father wants the son to know that. If you follow my wise instruction, son or daughter, you are setting yourself up 
for the blessing of God. Remember, the Proverbs we said, they're not promises, but they are meant to motivate us toward the path of God's blessing. And with a list like that, any child would be foolish not to pursue his father's wise instruction. Here's where this gets exciting as a parent, though. Parents, would you like your children, grandparents, would you like your grandchildren to experience that list of blessings? Absolutely. Of course you would. Of course you would. Even if you don't have children, would you like to see the young people who are important to you receive these blessings from God? Absolutely you would. Recognize this. Your wisdom as a parent or as a grandparent or as even a mentor enables you to transmit the blessing of God to those younger people whom God has placed in your life. That makes our task of parenting and leading children a very beautiful and solemn role. We get to be a conduit of grace to our children. Nobody's going to be able to transmit the blessings of God in quite the same way as the parent will for the child. And when we walk in God's wisdom, and when we instruct our children in wisdom, we open up the floodgates of God's blessings to pour into our children that they might experience the abundant life that Christ offers. It's wonderful to think that as parents we have the privilege to transmit God's blessing to our children. So wise parents transmit God's blessing to our children. Wise parents, secondly, we also reflect God's love to our children. So we transmit God's blessing to our children, but we also transmit God's love to our children. The concept of love in the Bible is rich, and it's broader than attraction or just warm feelings. We could actually go all the way back to the covenant that God made with the people of Israel to show that there's a direct connection between our love and our actions. That's something that we're not necessarily used to thinking about, but in the Bible, there's always a direct connection between our love and what we do. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So you heard there that link between loving God and keeping his commandments. But it's not just an Old Testament idea at all, is it? Jesus said this in the New Testament just before he was crucified. If you love me, you will do what? You will keep my commandments. That's why expressing love is difficult. It's not as simple as just feeling good towards somebody. It requires sacrifice. But God doesn't just ask us to love him. He has shown the ultimate love to us. And he did that in sending Jesus Christ. Jesus said, remember later that night, greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. With this in mind, we understand that not only do wise parents transmit God's blessing, they also reflect God's love, and they do that by sacrificing for their children, taking certain actions for the benefit of their children. Now, when we think about the actions we would take to benefit our children to show God's love and transmit it to them, we might think of any number of things, you know, feeding them, clothing them, taking them to soccer games, whatever it might be. But the way the proverb speaks of parental love expressing itself most commonly is in a way we might not think of. It's through discipline. Now, when you think of that word discipline, when you hear that word, what comes into your mind? Self-control? Spanking? Maybe, uh, maybe somebody, you know, just being regular and eating well or going to the gym. I mean, maybe that's your idea of what discipline is. Do you think of correction, perhaps? 
Well, all of those ideas would kind of be tied up into this biblical concept of, of discipline here. They're all really included in the Proverbs teaching, not the, the one about food in the gym so much. But, uh, but let's focus on one proverb that really captures the idea that wise parents reflect God's love to their kids. Proverbs 13, 24 says this, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, hates his son. But whoever, who, he who loves his, him is discipline, diligent to discipline him. This verse uh, will not likely make it onto kids' list of all-time favorites. But it is critical. It is critical for parents who want to express God's love to their children. When we have to express God's love to our children or rebuke them or physically discipline, which, which is what the rod here signifies, it can be at least inconvenient. At times, it can be excruciating as a parent to correct our children. In such times, we might think to ourselves that disciplining our children is stifling or harsh or something like that, right? I mean... If you've been a parent, you've probably felt that. In extreme form, we might even think it feels like we are hating our kids when we correct them, uh, especially, in, especially when they manipulatively say that very th- same thing to us. The Bible views it differently. As uncomfortable as it can be to discipline our children, failing to do so is not love, it's hate. The parent who will not discipline his children is not displaying love for his kids. He's displaying hate. Why? He's taking the easy way out. She's taking the easy way out. The parents are elevating their own comfort above the child's future. But what then about parents who really genuinely are harsh or even abusive, God forbid, in their discipline of their children? Are those parents loving their children? Well, of course not. In fact, that becomes all the more obvious when we consider discipline as an expression of love. Over and over in the Proverbs, we hear the relational context for proper discipline. It's a caring parent yearning for his son's success. My son, walk in wisdom. My son, fear the Lord. My son, my son, my son, I want what's best for you. Follow my instruction. So it is in wanting what's best for our children that we discipline them because as Proverbs 22.15 says, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. The point of this verse, in addition to speaking about the disciplinary process, it's trying to underscore for parents the idea that our children are not naturally wise. Our children are naturally foolish. Now, they can be forgiven for that because at a young age, they know no different. And it's the loving parent's role to shepherd that child into a path of wisdom. And that comes through the expression of discipline within a loving relationship. Wise parents reflect God's love by setting their kids up for a life of loving God. If our children are not disciplined, if we don't walk in the way of wisdom with them, they won't know what it means to walk in God's wisdom. They won't even know what it means to love God. Wise parents transmit God's blessing to their children. They reflect God's love for their children. And they also, they also thirdly, follow God's model. For their children. The key verses that link our parenting to God's parenting are Proverbs 3 11 through 12. We read there, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father the son in whom he tolerates. No. The son in whom he delights. 
until Jesus began to teach in the first century AD, the idea of God's fatherhood was not really in the center of the radar. Jesus constantly, though, referred to God as Father. It was a relational term. It, it's a term of intimacy. The idea of God the Father it wasn't absent from the Old Testament. It just wasn't as prominent as Jesus made it. And here we have one of the fatherly passages that we do see in the Old Testament. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. Beside reinforcing that wise parents express God's love, this passage shows us directly that when parents guide their children lovingly, they are following the model of God himself, who lovingly leads his children. For God... All of his parental discipline, if you want to call it that, is according to this verse for those whom he loves. And those who receive his discipline are the objects of his delight. Why is this important that wise parents follow God's model? It's not just that God is the best parent ever, so following his model obviously makes sense. How often have you, as a parent, or as a grandparent perhaps, or even as a mentor or a leader, felt that what you were doing was mundane? It was thankless. It was boring. Have you ever felt that as a parent, or as a grandparent, or even as somebody who leads people who are younger than you? You're up at Three in the morning with the baby and thinking, hmm, this is genuinely brutal. (laughs) What have I gotten myself into here? Or maybe you have older kids, middle schoolers or teenagers, and you're walking through with them through muddy waters and anxieties that make you literally sick to your stomach. Maybe that's happened. And and you're thinking to yourself, this is so hard. I don't even know what to do. And sometimes when I do know what to do, I don't think I've got the strength to do it. Maybe you have adult children. And they are living in a way that does not in any way resemble how you brought them up. The parenting verse that rings in your head at night when you go to sleep is, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And you hear that, and you know it's not a promise, but you think to yourself, I tried to do this right. We tried to do this right. What benefit did we gain from all that heartache? Now maybe, maybe, you're in a very different place right now and you're reflecting on your relationship with your kids and you're feeling an overwhelming sense of gratitude and a beautiful joy because of what your parenting experience is like right now. That'd be fantastic. And it may be your experience. You might even think to yourself, where does this depth of joy come from? Why is it that my, my role as a parent is so deeply important to me? When we see that our role as parents reflects the parenthood of God, we start to get why we have such deep sorrows and such triumphant joys in parenting. Being a parent is perhaps the purest expression that we have of the solemn privilege and responsibility of being made by God in his image. Because we were made in his image to be stewards over his creation. And in perhaps no relationship is that clearer and more unalloyed than in the parent-child relationship. Long after God made man in his image, Jesus Christ came to this earth. And he lived and he died and he rose again. And after he rose, he gave his disciples a mission. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We express it this way at Eastside. 
We want to meet people where they are and move them to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We who are in the church think of this as a call to win converts. And it is that, but it's more. When we make disciples, they trust in Jesus Christ, they cross from death to life, they grow in Christ's likeness, obedience, and guess what? Wisdom. It is all too easy for us to forget that the children God has given us are the primary disciples over which he has given us stewardship and that our parenting and that the love for God that it enables in our children are at the epicenter of God's mission to make disciples. Here's the simple truth today. God's mission depends on godly parents. God's mission depends on godly parents. I want to ask you to bow your heads right now as we consider how God is speaking to each of us individually today. I'm going to ask you a question, and we're going to take a minute to to kind of think through that, and then maybe a second or third question. You don't have to wonder if God is speaking to you right now. God is speaking to you right now. He desires to speak to you. We want to give him our attention. That's what this is all about. So think through this question. In my role as a parent, or even as a grandparent, or as a mentor, or as an influencer in a close relationship, based on what I've heard, what is the biggest barrier to my parenting right now? What's holding me back from more fully pursuing God's mission through my parenting? Take that barrier, think about that barrier, and then ask this question, what change, what change would it require in my life that that barrier would no longer be there? question we we said that this parenting this wise parenting is based off of the model of God's parenting of us so the third and maybe the most important question today is is God my father the scripture says that he's not everyone's father at least in one sense because he is father only to those who have trusted in Jesus Christ alone to save them from their sins and give them eternal life. If you've never placed your trust in Jesus Christ alone, there's nothing you do to do that. It's faith. It's not faith in nothing. It's not blind faith by any means. It's recognition of the fact that God created you in his image, and that's why you love your kids so much. But you, like I, have gone astray. We've sinned against God by going our own way. And the scripture says the only way that we were able to deal with that issue was something that we didn't do in the first place. Jesus Christ came and died and showed the ultimate love of a parent for us. And today, by trusting in Jesus Christ alone to save you from your sins and give you eternal life, you can cross from death to life. He died for your sins. He was raised from the dead on the third day. And all who will trust in him to save them will step into eternal life. He's a good father. And he wants to use us as mothers and fathers to carry out his mission. He's got the resources that we need. We 
Will you let him parent you as you parent? 